Well, the riches are very powerful because the riches, is if they had anything, they had money. And money in itself is power. He was doing no different to what any banker is doing in the city, but he come from the wrong side of the fence. The villain's only weapon is pain. Pain is their only option. You do not build an empire of scrap metal yards like Charlie did, you know, without throwing a nice few right-handers here and there. I'm Fred Dynage. This is the exclusive story of the notorious Richardson gang. For the first time on television, gang leader Charlie Richardson and his associates are going to tell the truth behind their brutal reputation. Were they businessmen, torturers, or gentlemen gangsters? The story of gangland London in the 60s has always fascinated me. I've written the craze biography and more recently made a documentary about the twins. Now I'm revisiting that world again, this time to tell the story of the Richardsons, Charlie and Eddie. They're famously known as the South London rivals to the East End Cray twins. According to legend, the feud came to a head with the shooting of Richardson associate George Cornell by Ronnie Cray. For years, the press had labelled them the torture gang, along with accusations of extortion, fraud, protection rackets and violent crime. The Richardsons, on the other hand, believe they were caught in the middle of a frenzied media circus. Charlie, the older of the two brothers, has always avoided the cameras. But now he's promised to meet me here and tell me the true story behind the gang that controlled much of London's crime in the 60s and dominated the headlines. Why, Charlie, why after all these years have you yeah. decided to tell your story? Well, I think that we owe it to the family, really, to put our side of the story. If you can do it properly, we want to do it. You know, it's an, it's an interesting story. The truth is much better than all the mythology. Like they talk about the Richardson gang. Oh, it's crazy. In my gang, I had five kids indoors. <laughs> So there was no gang? No, no gang. Why do we want a gang? Silly. Charlie and Eddie, leaders of what later became known as the Richardson Gang, grew up in Camberwell, South London. Charlie was born in 1934, followed by younger siblings Eddie, Alan and Elaine. Much of their childhood was spent during the Second World War. What about when you were young, though? Were you a bit of a handful? No, I don't think so. Not, not, they're just ordinary kids. Well, 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 you've got to remember all bombing was going on when I was a kid. You know, school, we only went here and there because the schools were shut over the bombing. With school interrupted by the war, 11-year-old Charlie and 9-year-old Eddie spent their free time developing techniques to beat the rations. We should put away the traffic lights. Jump on a rubber and change the lights. Time the lorry come out, the lights would be red. We'd climb on the back, steal the apples, put them down your jumper. At just 14 years of age, Charlie had become a dab hand at stealing cars for nights out and special occasions until in 1949 he was caught in the act. He was sent to Lambeth Juvenile Court and sentenced to three years in a correctional facility for boys. Less than a year later, with the help of his father, he busted out. Charlie was caught and taken to Wormwood Scrubs as punishment, followed by another reform school. On his release, he worked for his uncle Jim, buying used farm sacks from all over the UK. This gave 16-year-old Charlie an idea. And I thought I'd do this on my own, you understand? And I got the little warehouse and took it over. My mum come and work for me as a cashier. And then that's what we done, you know, prepared for scrap metals. Charlie's scrap metal empire was born. Another famous South London gangster and for a time member of the Richardson gang was mad Frankie Fraser. 
Frankie, who of course became associated with the use of pliers for his own particular specialised form of dentistry, although to be fair, I've yet to meet anyone who actually witnessed that. Frank's invited me to join him for a drink at his local, the Hollydale Tavern. Look back on South London for me in the wartime. What was that like? Oh, wonderful. I'll never forgive it, love for surrendering. Why? Well, everything was rationed, and you could get whatever you wanted and sell it on and all over the country and everything. Of course, once the war was over, a lot of them things that were rationed wasn't then. And things were evening out then a bit, yeah. They were wonderful days of war. Charlie made the most of the post-war years and the scrap metal business was becoming successful. Charlie and younger brother Eddie were developing a name for themselves. I'd just come out of prison and my sister told me what terrific guys they were. She knew the Richardsons through her husband and that's how I come to meet them and I liked them very much, yeah. But the government got in the way of Charlie's developing business. In 1953, he was conscripted to the army. By the time I come 18, I didn't want to go in the army because I was earning money, you understand, with the scrap business. And, you know, having a good time, I didn't want to be fucked about in the army a pound a week, did I, you know? And I thought I'd got to get out of this somehow. So, so what did you do? Well, I tried to make out I was mad and different things, you know. In the end, they gave me six months and slung me out. Charlie was court-martialed and sent to the military prison at Shepton Mallet for six months. Here, he met the Cray twins for the first time. Little did he know that they would later be thought of as his infamous rivals from the East End. I'm going to meet a man I've known for many years, a man whose reputation precedes him. He's one of the only Englishmen accepted into the American Mafia families. He helped me to write the craze biography and almost gives me a wise perspective on events. He's Wilf Pine, always known as one of the chaps and close friend of the Cray twins, and Charlie Richardson. South London, East London, in terms of crime, what's the difference? Ah, right, that's a good one. South London, they were the brains. Train robbery. All South London villains done that. They were absolute masters at uh, doing what they'd done, you know. The East End at that period of time was more about giving you a good right-hander, you know. With them it was muscle, nine times out of ten it was robbery with violence. That is the difference between the two. Charlie was released from Shepton Mallet Glasshouse. His first order of business to buy another scrapyard here in Addington Square. Despite being sent to correctional school and being banged up in Wormwood Scrubs and Army Prison, the Richardson Empire continued to grow. The strong arm of the law, it seemed, wasn't strong enough. Got out of the army, you know, eh? and started again. Build it up. And you were very successful? Yeah, successful with it. It's just something in us, really, Fred, you know. In intuition, isn't it, really? Be honest with me, Charlie. Well, was there any criminal activity at that time? Well, I suppose there was. If anybody had it in that arse, we thought we could earn a pound out of it, we would buy it crooked, you, you understand? I would never ask too many questions about it, did you? Otherwise, people wouldn't come here. They'd go somewhere else. Anybody with any sense knows you don't get a reputation like Charlie had in those early years by being a choir boy. But you've got to bear in mind, it was the post-war years when he started to come into prominence. You've got to use your own imagination, you know. You don't build an empire of scrap metal yards like Charlie did, you know, without throwing a nice few right-handers here and there, because that's the people you're dealing with. It's mostly illegal entrepreneurs that are bringing the stuff in, it's them trying to rip him off. So you had to be tough. Eddie was now working with Charlie and their tough guy reputations were spreading. The thing with Eddie, you know, it's a load of close pals of his that I, we're mutually acquainted with. So, you know, the guy was a real hard case. You know, he was a, a genuine tough guy. By that, I mean, he, he didn't have to act it. He was one. 
And with him, you know, a bare knuckle fight, nine times out of ten, he'd win. Reformed villain Bobby Cummins served time in prison with Charlie Richardson and got to know him well. Bobby has turned his life around completely. He now works closely with the government and runs a charity for ex-offenders called Unlock. It was a very brutal time. Men was coming back from the war, shell-shocked. There was the shortage of, of goods. And so racketeering was a normal way of life. And when you come from South London, North London or what, you know, you, you do what you've got to do to survive. Charlie was a businessman. If Charlie had been brought up in a different time, in a different family, Charlie Richardson would have probably been one of your top businessmen because he, he was about money. Charlie's success gave him the stability to settle down and in 1955 he married, later having five children. Eddie too tied the knot in 1956. But soon disaster struck the family. The youngest Richardson brother, Alan, sadly died in a boating accident on the Thames. And your other brother? Alan, I lost him. Going through a fucking water on the Thames, going through a tunnel, a boat got in front of us, a big boat, it caused the waves, hit the bridge and turned the boat over. We're both in the water, aren't we? Ruin me. In prison, we to think about him every night. You know, lovely kid, a lovely, lovely brother. And he was in business with you, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, I let him out that warehouse in Edith and Square. Yeah. And the day I took him out of here and threw 400 quid that day, I was really proud of him, you know what I mean? Sad, isn't it? Yeah, fucking tragic. The family tragedy left just two brothers, Charlie and Eddie. But as the 60s approached, they were entering their infamous glory days. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. I'm Fred Dynich, and for the first time on television, I'm telling the true story of the infamous 1960s South London gangsters, the Richardson brothers. I'm meeting Charlie Richardson and his associates face to face. He's kept well away from TV cameras until now, but his revelations could well change crime history forever. By the early 60s, Charlie and Eddie Richardson were only in their 20s, but together they were running a successful scrap metal empire with other growing businesses. You ran South London. I, I never really, I just run my own business there. I suppose I had about six or seven shops, good shops, and we had warehouses, three or four warehouses, and I had a lot of five or six good scrapyards. Charlie was the man to go to in South London. The old bill, right, I think they were on, what, 15 quid a week or something in them days. Most of them were bent, right? They would nick a certain face. Before I nick you, go and see Charlie's. Right, you're in trouble. Tell him you're in trouble, tell you who's nicked you. Charlie used to brokerage the deals to get the guys out of jail by paying off the old bill. He was the man to go to. On the other side of the river, the Cray twins were developing their own reputation for business. Chris Lambriano was a loyal member of the Cray's firm. He even served 14 years for helping to cover up Reggie Cray's brutal stabbing and murder of Jack the Hat McVitty. Chris knows only too well the reality of gangland London in the 60s and the consequences the way of life had on those involved. Gangland life was a conglomeration of different firms coming from different angles, doing different things. Long firm, protection money, nightclubs, gambling, bank robbery, post office robbery. They were all specialists in their field. Every firm had a character. And in them days, you'd meet up at lunchtime in a pub and firms would cross each other. But we've got a bit of work here, we need your man here, or we need that guy here. And so firms were interchanging all the time. The place to be seen for any firm was the Astor Club in Mayfair's Barclay Square. You'd be in there, there'd be a firm there, a firm there, another firm there, another firm there. All well-capable people 
On the other hand, you had Orson Welles sat there with a couple of his boyfriends. You got like Nobby Styles and Georgie Best there. Everybody mingled. And f interestingly enough, the first person to ever get a membership at the Astor was Charlie Richardson. He, he went in, everybody followed. <laughs> Even now, Charlie Richardson has pulling power outside of the criminal world and in the world of celebrity. That is demonstrated by the man I'm going to meet now, Stephen Burkoff, Hollywood actor, prolific playwright and author, and good friend of Charlie's. If you come from the working classes, as I have, you cannot help but have an association with villains. You're a child, a teenager, and you hear about these young men getting into trouble and doing incredible capers. And they become, in a way, heroes. Not because you admire thievery and killing and brutality, but you admired the sense that these people were kicking against authority. People from our neck of the woods aspired to be like them. So if you like, they, they were powerful, they were very powerful. Um, if they labelled you a rat or a wrong, you weren't going nowhere. So if they wanted to do you damage, they didn't have to pull pliers and electrodes out on you. Their word was enough to finish your criminal career. That these people were physically brave. There was something a bit noble about them. We tended to cherish and value people of courage. In fact, they were villains. Well, who, who gives a monkey's toss? More villains were in Parliament. A particular speciality for business-minded Charlie was the long firm fraud operations. Ah, oh, well, the long firm was brilliant. You'd uh, set up an office somewhere, you get somebody to front it, you get them a bank account, and then you start ordering quantities of stuff. You and to start off with, you'd be paying all the time. When your credit rating was really, really running high and good, that's when you'd order in the lot, you know, tremendous amount of stuff. And then you would just set it on for a little very money, shut the office up, and nobody knows you've been there. That was the long firm. They made hundreds of thousands, if not more, out of that game. But that was Charlie's brain. The Richardsons were making serious money, and the London underworld knew it. Estimates at one point put the turnover at one and a half million pounds a year. But this drew jealousy from other quarters, especially East End gangsters, the Crays. What about the Cray twins? How did you get on with them? Oh, right, that was all right. I'll never see a lot of them. Was the rivalry? Not really, no, because they wasn't into what I was into. You know, they was all good boys, but I was, you know, we was so far ahead of them, you understand? I think to start off with, it was only real in uh, the twin's head. And I was having this conversation with Ronnie one day, and he'd open up now and again, and I said, what really give you the arse eight with the Richardsons? Very quietly, he said, just for the money. They had pots of money, and we just have to go out every night and earn some more. In the next breath, he says, I'll tell you something. He said, I tried to put us all together, right, you know, like Joe Pyle, the Nashes, uh, Ginger Dennis, all different firms all over London. He says that we'd all be one because the Yanks were coming in, you know, and if we're all together, we can all help each other and we can all learn together. He said, and I had a meeting, he said, and I put it to them. He said, and they just laughed in my face, you know. Yes, said, so who was that? Did you know, Charlie. He said, you know, I want to wish you well. Your business is your business. My business is my business. But that doesn't include us. We don't need it. As the Richardson empire grew, the brothers started to go their separate ways. Eddie went into business with experienced villain Frankie Fraser. Their main focus was on a fruit machine enterprise in the West End clubs. Was protection ever involved in this? Yes, of course. Because if you had your machines in a club, the club owner could then tell people, no, watch your step with the machines. They're not mine, they belong to Eddie and Frank, etc. And that's how it all happened. At your peak, 
How many machines did you have? How All many over clubs? The country. Did you? We're talking about two or three hundred, say, more. Yeah. What sort of money were you making? Making very good money, yeah. But nonetheless, your brother, mm. Eddie, and Frankie Fraser did have a lot of interest. They was there with the fruit machines, yeah. getting in, upsetting fucking people, making them take their machines out and putting their machines in. But nothing to do with me, Fred. So you never had any of that interest? Nothing. In I, I wasn't interested in fucking fruit machines. I was getting a good living anyway. Frankie Fraser already had a dangerous reputation, and now aligned with tough man Eddie, they were feared by many. Eddie and Frank together were a lethal combination. You didn't mess about with them kind of people. They had the West End sewn up. I like Frank an awful lot because I spent time with him in prison. And if I will say one thing, he was loyal to the men in prison. He would die for them. But on the other hand, out on the street, Frank was just, you know, doing what Frank did. Terrified. Even today he'll tell you he's not, you know, he's beloved ex or his, you know, whatever he was using, his tool of choice, as it were. Eddie knew how far to push it, so did Frank. They knew just when to stop. With Eddie and Frankie making money from businesses across the country, Charlie decided to expand his interests abroad. In 1964, he moved to South Africa to pursue his passion for mining, a natural progression from scrap metals. This guy could be an incredible geological engineer. He has the brain, but because he was brought up in a certain way, didn't have the proper education, didn't have opportunities, and they went into scrap iron, and, but he knows about metals. He knows more about metals than most metallurgists. Charlie has suggested I meet with his current lawyer, a fascinating figure in his own right, dubbed the devil's advocate because of his association with several high-profile defendants, including Ronnie Biggs, Harold Shipman and Saddam Hussein. His name is Giovanni De Stefano. How crooked was Charlie in the 60s? Well, he's an opportunist. Uh, I'm not not really sure he was a crook. How many villains uh, do you know that you've researched that actually have a business in Africa? <laughs> not many, uh, uh, whose passions are in mining. He was a visionary, the first person to realise that Africa offered something for the white man other than having a whip and beating black people into submission. By 1965, the Richardsons were at their peak. Charlie's international mining business was growing and Eddie had the West End sewn up. Would you say at your peak you felt invincible? Uh, yeah, really, yeah, I suppose I did, because I wasn't really doing anything wrong, you understand? And if I was, I covered it all properly, you know. So you felt strong? Yeah, I never murdered anybody, never shot anybody, because it was against my beliefs, murdering somebody. You understand, really, Fred? I know it sounds silly, but it's true. But it was a fatal shooting that would bring about the Richardson's demise. I'm Fred Dynage, and this is the story of the Richardson brothers, Charlie and Eddie. Now Charlie, who was dubbed the torture boss, is revealing everything to me for the first time on television. It's 1965. Eddie, together with Frankie Fraser, was running a fruit machine business and had developed a tough reputation. 10,000 miles away, Charlie got to know the South African secret society, the Bruderband. A member asked him to tap the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson's phone. Charlie was perfectly placed to do this with a cleaning company he owned that was employed at number 10. In those days, you physically had to go put a chewing gum under the table with a little microphone and put it there. And the only people who could do that were the were cleaners. Did you you tap the Prime Minister's phone? Yeah, somebody done it, yeah. And my five went mad. I never realised what I was doing, really. I just wanted to get it out of my get away and get on with the mining. If you have planted a bug, 
in number 10 Downing Street means you know about it. And therefore, if you know about it, you might know the results of the conversations. You then become no longer a person that's been useful. You were useful at the time, but you're now expendable. Meanwhile, back in the UK, trouble was brewing for Eddie and Frankie Fraser with rival firms. This resulted in a violent clash in the Mr Smith's nightclub in Catford. The night of the 7th of March 1966 has now become part of gangland legend. They had kicked off there um, with two firms and nobody knew exactly who it was at the time. And then it came up with the Richardsons were involved. I knew Charlie wasn't involved because I knew Charlie was in South Africa. But it could, it could only be Eddie and it could only be Frank. Frank Fraser. Frank Fraser. And I, I know Frank got shot in the leg and I know Eddie got shot somewhere as well. But there was Hart who got shot. That was from the other firm. And it, this had been some rivalry that had been going on, something to do with protection. It was, it was a kind of a whole thing that had gone and finally kicked off in, in, in this Mr Smith's. Frankie Fraser was at the centre of the action. Yes. So happened another little gang was in there and they were looking for trouble and they sort of went for us and naturally that was their mistake. We went for them then. And were you guilty? Well, I got caught. <laughs> and who got killed there? Only another guy like myself. I, I was lucky, I, I got injured and won the fight. He was unlucky, he lost. How did he get killed? Was he shot? A bit of everything. Was it? Hammer, knife. Mm. Both Eddie Richardson and Frankie Fraser had been injured and rival Dickie Hart shot dead. Police suspected Frankie Fraser of pulling the trigger, but struggled to find the evidence to prove it. The next night, Richardson associate George Cornell was shot by Ronnie Cray in the Blind Beggar pub. The media suggested this was a revenge killing. And this is from Ronnie's lips to me. Ronnie was legless drunk. He goes to the, uh, this little spieler card game place with a, a boyfriend. Little loudish or whatever, George Cornell kicks seven bells out of Ronnie. He gives Ronnie Kay a beating like you can't believe. In normal circumstances, you would think that the next day there'd be repercussions. But Reg said to Ronnie, hold up there, we've got interest here, we've got interest there. There'll be a time, there'll be a place. But as Ronnie told me, Right, when he heard that Cornell was at the beggar, it was nothing to do with this revenge Richardson thing. He just, it was his chance to kill him. In South Africa, Charlie heard news of Eddie's predicament and decided to return to the UK, a decision he would ultimately regret. One person who'll be able to tell me why is Ronnie Richardson. She and Charlie have been together for 24 years and she knows him better than anyone. She is a highly intelligent businesswoman and nothing at all like the gangster's wife that you might expect. Was it a mistake to come back and help his brother, do you think? I, I think from Charlie's point of view, definitely, but it's his brother. He loved him. You know, I mean, despite any any indifferences that they might have, he, he loved him and he would have done anything to help him. He'd already lost um, his young brother. Um, you know, that broke his heart. He, he didn't want anything serious to happen to, to Eddie. Well, I was out of the country. When I flew back from South Africa, I see a notice board up, like a newspaper stand about a shoeing at Catford. And like the sixth sense come in again, I had not knew it should have something to do with Eddie. Getting doors ring up, it was him, he was in hospital. Got shot in the arse or something. Big shootout of Mr Smith's. Was he cross afterwards, Charlie, that you'd got into all that bother? He was really, yeah. He didn't want to see us get into trouble over such a silly little 
thing, you know, fight in a club sort of style. It's a great night. Great night. Hmm. On the 28th of June, 1966, Eddie and Frankie Fraser went on trial for the Mr. Smith shootout. Charlie remained in the UK to help his brother. You spoke to the witnesses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we had the witnesses in Smith's club. Oh, yeah, I got them all right. They was all right. They said what I wanted them to say. But you shouldn't have done that, should I you? I know, but I'd, now I would never do it now. I'd fucking get out of get, get away, wouldn't you? I can't leave them. They've got to see me up Brixton, visiting them. Just for your brother? For my brother, yeah, because I love my brother. The Mr. Smith's trial collapsed and a retrial was ordered. The police were determined to break the power base that Charlie and Eddie had built. With so many of the Met on the brothers' payroll, a policeman was brought in from the outside to lead the investigation, Gerald MacArthur, the assistant chief constable of Hertfordshire. On the 30th of July, 1966, World Cup final day, Charlie was arrested during a dawn raid along with a number of his associates. Tell me about the day they came for you. Well, early in the morning, like, you know, five or six in the morning, all the top coppers there, all woke all my kids up, my wife, you know. I made a cup of tea, feed my teeth, and away I went with them for 18 years. On the 4th of April, 1967, the trial began. Charlie, Eddie and Frankie all facing serious charges. The press dubbed it the torture trial. You know, it sells newspapers. If they said, like right, Charlie Rich and bash the guy up, you get a column that big in a newspaper. Torture? Oh, yeah, front page stuff, and we're going to run with this for weeks, and we're going to have a trial, and it makes the police look good. We've captured this notorious gang. Having experienced it myself during the Cray trial, going to court and the celebrities coming up and sitting there opposite the jury, listening to everything, because there was drama there. The charges included electric shock treatment, men bound and gagged, beatings with a lump of iron, teeth pulled out with pliers and mock trials, all called torture by the press. The Richardsons were not about going and having protection rackets and you must pay 10% or 20%. This was about people who they had lent money and they wanted it back. It was more sort of a refreshing uh, 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 element to refresh your mind in case, you know, you suffered from economical memory. You know, the bit that made that, that trial worse is when one of them says, Fraser pulled out my tooth, you know. He never pulled anybody's teeth out. I don't think he knew what a pair of pliers were, Frank. He knew what a hatchet was. You know, he planted that in Eric Mason's head. There was all these stories about you and torture and pliers, teeth being pulled out, electric shocks. When I was doing that 20 years, wouldn't I have loved it if I could have been in my cell going, oh, what a good job you made as that back molar. It wasn't true, though, unfortunately. What about all the stories, though, of torture and oh, pliers? Oh, it's all civil, civil mythology you know, by newspapers. They've even got a black box in the fucking museum in Scotland Yard, electric box. What they said, it was ours. Nothing to do with us at all. They went and bought it and produced it at the trial and said it was a box like this. But did they use it? No, nobody used it. They've had to. These people, Fred, you know, they'd sell you the, Everything, so you're their mother. So you can look me, Charlie, in the eye yeah, and say, on. hand on heart, I never tortured anybody. Never tortured anybody. I never done it anyway. Never said I'd done it. I said I told other people to do it. And did you? No, not at all. No need for it, Fred. Why? I want to get my money back, it's all. There's an inconsistency between what Charlie says and the charges he was facing. The prosecution produced a string of witnesses, mostly former associates, testifying to gruesome acts of torture and violence. Over the years, some have recanted their statements. Others have not. The villain's only weapon is pain. They do not have the advantage 
of legal expertise and all the rest of the horrible, fraudulent, scum-sucking, money-sucking lawyers that charge £400 an hour to wank around with your case. Pain is their only option. So, they went too far, if that is so. No question about that. Rumour had it about Eddie and Frank, but I never heard any rumours about Charlie. Charlie wasn't a player in the West End. He didn't want to be a heavyweight villain or anything else like that. Charlie, in his mind, I think, was looking for a pot of gold. But Charlie's pot of gold was now out of reach, and the brothers' prospects were looking bleak. I'm Fred Dynage, and in this documentary, I've been given exclusive access to one of the most notorious gangs in British criminal history. This is the true story of the Richardson Gang. By April 1967, Charlie Richardson, Eddie Richardson and Frankie Fraser were on trial facing serious accusations labelled torture. Well, we've got to remember Charlie and Eddie had hardly ever been in, well, Eddie had hardly ever been in trouble in his life. And Charlie, I think, had only been to prison once about six months. So really, they knew nothing about cults or anything. And they used to ask me how it was going, and I just had to tell them the truth. It looks very bad. And bad it was. For Charlie, Eddie and Frankie, a guilty verdict was given. Frankie Fraser got 10 years for two counts of GBH and demanding money with menaces. Eddie Richardson received 10 years for one count of GBH and two counts of ABH, plus another five years for his involvement in the Mr. Smith shootout. Charlie Richardson was convicted of four counts of GBH, two of ABH, one of robbery with violence, and two charges of demanding money with menaces. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. How did you feel when you... Well, I said, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else could I say? Nothing, could you? Yeah. I mean, 25 years he was sentenced to. Unprecedented. Uh, unfair? Unprecedented. Leave aside unfair. Um, the appropriate sentence was between five and seven years. He definitely sh didn't warrant the, the sort of sentence that he got. Whether he would have warranted a couple of years, maybe, for being a little bit naughty, yeah. Both Charlie and Eddie were initially sent to Durham prison. Charlie was labelled Category A and placed in a maximum security wing. He was deemed to be a threat to national security, to fellow inmates and to the public and was regularly moved from prison to prison to prevent him from escaping. I was on a 24-hour watch, lie on in the cell. I was on a special watch for about 13, 14 years. How did you, how did you cope with that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I was strong-minded, that's all. Well, you know, I had a big family, I didn't want to let my family down, my kids. When he first went in, uh, Frank would say, oh, you know, fight them all the way, fight them, beat them all. Um, and he did. And then he just sat back one day and he said, you know what, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm, I'm just not going to carry on like this. I'm going to beat them the best way I know how. And that was to educate himself, and that's what he did. What got you through? Was it was it reading? Was know. it belief? Was it? I was I studied, didn't I? I done open university, done A levels, O levels, and I'm not an academic person really, but I had to do it for my letter writing to my kids and everybody. He, he was a highly intelligent man, but he was also well read, so he's a very interesting man. And when you're in there for that length of time, you get fed up with hearing about the crimes we've committed and who's done what. And to have someone talking about totally different things like Africa and, and Open University and Charlie would talk about philosophy, psychology, you name it. I mean, he'd read it. Charlie would leave a book on my bed as he was passing myself. I'd read it and think, Charlie wishes he'd read that book. It moved me to tears. You can imagine a man sitting in prison. It's the loneliest place in the world. 15 years, you look in the head, there's nothing. 
But the man told me if I threw my head over the wall, my body would follow. And it did. Charlie's younger brother, Eddie, was released from Pentonville Prison in August 1976, having served 10 years. Charlie, on the other hand, was still serving a much longer sentence. The only time he really, as he said, he cracked, I think, was in about 81, and he needed to get away, and he absconded then, um, just to get his sanity back, really. They put me in open prison. I fucked off from there for about six months, went to Paris and everywhere, I would have, you know, and enjoyed myself, went to Spain. <laughs> I had to do it, because you can only do so much, but I would have cracked your brain in. Got on a plane and off he went and had the life of Riley. And then when he thought, well, I've had enough, this, I better go back and sort it out, came back yourself, you know? You've got to give that guy 100 out of 100. Charlie was released on the 24th of August, 1984, after serving 18 years of his 25-year sentence. It wasn't long before he met Ronnie, who became a partner in life and business. He's scared to death of her. Scared to death of her. She is an absolutely lovely, lovely lady. He loves her most dearly. She the same with him, but she keeps him under control. You see, everybody I talk to uh, about you and Charlie says that you are very much the power behind the throne and... I'm glad they didn't say that in the 60s. <laughs> They'd have given me 25 with him. Uh, well, I don't know. I think, I think I'm probably the stabling influence behind the relationship because, as I said, he's a naughty little boy and you have to, you know, remind him. To, to stay, you know, on the straight and narrow. Unlike his brother, Eddie refused to keep his nose clean and developed a new form of criminal activity, drug smuggling in conjunction with a cartel from Colombia. He was arrested several times during the Christmas period of 1988 and eventually charged with drugs importation and sentenced to 25 years in prison. He was released in 2001, having served 12 years. Charlie and Eddie no longer speak. Throughout their older years, the once close brothers have gone their separate ways. And since you came out of prison, have you been 100% straight? I, I have really, yeah, because I thought, oh, why, why shouldn't I do it straight? I'm not a fucking fool. You know, I've got as much brain as anybody else, so I understand how it all works. Why don't I do it properly? And that's what we've done. I mean, I tried a few crooked things when I first came out. I had to get myself moving a bit. But I soon realised that I've got to drop it out and do it properly. Frankie's been back in prison. Eddie's been back in prison. Yeah. Charlie never has. No. Has he gone straight in all that time? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he has his own businesses, you know. Is it fair to ask you, or reasonable to ask you, and say if it's not the sort of businesses that, that, that you are both in at the moment? Um, yes, well, it's all very legitimate. We're involved in mining, which has been Charlie's passion for most of his life. Even though it's 45 years since the torture trial, the Richardson's tough reputation remains. But is it deserved? He had the ability to, to frighten people. He's an old man now. Does he still? Oh, he can still make you feel your pants, Fred. He could still make you feel your pants. Old? Maybe. Not well? Yep. But is he capable? Oh, most definitely. In all my time in prison, I never see Charlie ever threaten anybody. He didn't need to. He was well-versed, well-read, very, very affable man. I mean, one time I said, Charlie, what are you talking that man? He was a tramp. And he said, Chris, everybody's got a story. Another time he said to me, Chris, he said, I cried for a man with no shoes until I met a man with no feet. That was Charlie Richardson. I mean, it would be much more interesting if I sat here and told you, yes, the black box was true, and um, yes, he tortured people, and yes, he was this, and it would be far more interesting because people, human nature seems to like that. But I'm sorry to disappoint them. When you look back, Charlie, mm. regrets? Oh, yeah, I'd do it differently, because I would. 
I'd be loyal to my family, my kids, and forget about anybody else, like Eddie, people like that. They don't they fight their own battles. I don't know how to say that, but I think I would, you know what I mean? You know, if I could, and look after my, my family. Throughout this documentary, I've been attempting to separate the fact from the myth in the Richardson story. To me, it seems the press created their own celebrity gangsters, and we've been happy to continue with that legacy. Even though we've met face to face in frank and truthful conversation, I still am unsure how much of the criminality and violence actually happened. I don't think we will ever know the full truth over the torture gang reputation. What I do know is that Charlie and his associates are the last of a generation. In their day, they played by their own rules and paid the price. Now, with their age, comes wisdom, and at times in our conversations, they have expressed regret. One thing I am sure of is this. We will never see gangsters like them again. Thank <laughs> you.